This morning we are in our third week of looking at the Jesus Creed, this powerful um, summary that Jesus gives us of two Old Testament commandments, which as we saw two weeks ago, I think it was, um, Jesus in this very revolutionary way fuses these two commands and says that they are a summary, a kind of distillation of everything that the Old Testament taught, that they are in the greatest commandment. And then last week we saw how this Jesus Creed actually shapes and fuels a life of prayer, a life of relationship with God, where we sign ourselves up for God's agenda and also lift up to Him our needs and the needs of our neighbors. And this week we are looking at how the Jesus Creed is fundamentally a creed for others, that In our world, we often think about the spiritual life as being a kind of inward, personal thing, but Jesus invites us to think about the spiritual life in its fullness as being one with an outward focus, looking at others and their needs. And this got me uh, thinking that most of our heroes of the faith, whether it's, you know, Mother Teresa or Dr. King, whoever that person might be for you, part of the reason you probably admire them is because they recognized this and lived a life for others. That's what, uh, when religious or spiritual faith is at its best, we can recognize it, and the fact that uh, it's lived for others is part of what helps us recognize that. But that's not always the case. I went um, to my Google search engine this week, and I typed in the phrase, why are Christians so... And you know how Google sometimes helps you, su- suggests, like, well, a lot of people have been asking this question. Maybe are you asking? So I was kind of curious what has been typed into the uh, Google machine. Um, and uh, you might not be surprised to hear. It wasn't, why are Christians so inspiring? <laughs> why are Christians so uh, different? Why are they so loving? It was, why are Christians so mean? So apparently a lot of people have been asking Google that question, and um, it is probably no surprise to us, something happens between Jesus teaching and preaching this Jesus Creed and us living and believing it, there's some kind of gap that happens, and we often fail to uh, live with that outward focus. This morning we're going to look at that uh, reality and also the solution to that reality by looking at one of the most famous, well-known, influential stories Jesus ever told, the parable of the Good Samaritan, which you can find on page 948. It comes in Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 25. So if you'd like to grab the Bible in front of you, um, I invite you to turn there with me. And I also invite you to pray with me before we read and ask God to help us. Father, we thank you that you love us, and you call us to be your children. And as your children, we ought to bear some family likeness to you. And we thank you that you use your word to do that, to help transform our minds, to renew them, so that we can see as you see, so that we might feel what you feel, we might love what you love. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would help us help each of us as we read this passage that many of us have heard before. Would you be gracious to us and help us to hear it in a new way this morning? And would you also help us not just to think about it with our minds in a new way, but let it settle down into our hearts, that it might flow out through our hands and feet, that it might transform not just the way we think, but the way we live. We need you to do that. And so we ask you to, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. I turn to page 984, not 948, so give me a second here. Luke chapter 10, we're beginning in verse 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied. How do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all 
with all your strength and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him? Jesus told him, Go and do likewise. Maybe one of the reasons that religious people often get a bad name is because we act a lot like this expert in the law. He uh, comes to ask Jesus a question, but we know, because Luke tells us, that there's something else going on. There's something behind his question. He comes to test Jesus. So this expert in the law comes to see uh, what he thinks of Jesus' answer to this question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Luke's signaling to us that he is not genuinely asking. He's not seeking. He's actually pretty satisfied with the answer he has, and he wants to see how Jesus' answer measures up to what he thinks. He's already got his mind made up. He knows the answer to what is the biggest question of them all. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And so he comes, he asks Jesus, and Jesus responds and says something like, well, you're the expert in the law, Mr. Know-it-all. What, what do you think? You've read it. Um, it's kind of surprising to me that uh, the expert in the law answers with the Jesus Creed. Did you notice that? And Jesus says, you nailed it. That doesn't often happen in these interactions that Jesus, um, when people come to ask Jesus questions, especially when they are um, know-it-all religious people, it's not often that Jesus says, well, yeah, you pretty much nailed it. Do that and you will live. But we see another glimpse into this man's heart uh, because we are told that he wants to justify himself. It's a really important clue to what's going on in his heart. He wants to justify himself. He wants to prove that he is in the right. He wants to um, prove that he is already established in the truth. Um, He's not seeking. Again, he's satisfied. He's satisfied with himself. He's satisfied with his answers. He's satisfied with his behavior, his creed, his life. And so he wants to prove that he has already done what he needs to do. So he asks this question to justify himself, and who is my neighbor? Which, we can all sort of see the question behind this question, right? He's not genuinely asking, okay, so who is my neighbor exactly? Because I'm so eager to go and love them. The question he's really asking is, who is not my neighbor, right? Who can I write off? Who do I not have to worry about? And I think it's this kind of thing, this dynamic, that gets people going to their Google search engines and writing, why are Christians so mean, right? We've got this incredible, expansive, generous, compelling, challenging call from Jesus to love God with all that we are and to love our neighbors as ourselves, but we so easily start to whittle this down looking for loopholes or shortcuts until this incredible invitation and this incredible challenge 
is just reduced to a small, manageable, uh, unassuming sort of religious chore chart that pretty much consists of all the jobs we already don't mind doing for all of the people that we already love. And there's this huge gap between the Jesus Creed and the lives we live. And so, so often we're all asking, who is my neighbor when what we really want to know is, who is not my neighbor? And so Jesus tells this very famous story about a priest and a minister and a rabbi who walk into a bar. I like to think of it as the first century version of that joke, in a way. He tells the story of a priest and a Levite who is a temple assistant, and they are coming down the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, and they come upon this man who's been beaten up and is left for dead. And they both do the exact same thing, even in terms of the language Jesus tells. They come up to him, they see him, and they pass by on the other side. First, the the priest does it, then the Levite follows a little while later, comes up to where the man is, sees him, and passes along the other side. And so we're thinking, Google, why are priests and Levites so mean, right? What's going on with these guys? Well, one important thing to know, as Scott McKnight um, informs us in the Jesus Creed, is that they probably had some good reasons to pass by. They may well have been just trying to be obedient to the law as they understood it. Because in Numbers chapter 19, verse 11 through 13, it says, Whoever touches a human corpse will be unclean for seven days. And if they fail to purify themselves after touching the human corpse, they defile the Lord's tabernacle. So if you're a priest or you're a Levite and you work in the temple, uh, this is a no-brainer for you. This is uh, hazardous to your occupation. And so it's not necessarily that they were just being callous or that they had no compassion. It's that their sense of their religious duty, ironically, uh, got in the way and prevented them and caused them to pass by, prevented them from helping this man. So they had jobs to do. They had responsibilities to uphold. They had other things they needed to be doing. And so it might not be that they just saw this man and said, ew, it might have been that they had other things that they needed to do in their minds. This got me thinking of a few years ago. uh, We used to live in the D.C. area, and there was a story on the radio maybe three or four years ago about a man, uh, I think he was a homeless man, who um, actually died in the street on this busy um, thoroughfare in the Columbia Heights neighborhood, and it just happened that where he was, there was a security camera that was filming the street. And so there's this very powerful image of um, all these people just walking by, going to work, going to the store, running errands, while this man is lying there half dead. And the radio show that I was listening to was sort of talking about this with this somewhat self-righteous, indignant tone, saying, you know, what kind of a society are we when I'm a man can just literally die in the street in the middle of the day and nobody stops to help. And I remember as I was driving around on my own errands, doing my own thing in the middle of the day, I thought to myself, I don't think I would have stopped. You know, like, I've passed by people who I assumed were sleeping on a bench and had other things to do. I'm not sure I would have stopped. I didn't even have, you know, some obscure passage from Numbers to quote. (laughs) I'm just on my, I'm just doing my thing. And I think that for the original hearers of this story, uh, this expert in the law, what would not shock him at all is that the priest and the Levite pass by. I don't think that would be a surprise at all. That would make sense. The shock of the story is not that the priest and the Levite pass by, but the shock of the story is, of course, the Samaritan stopping. And as many of us know, Samaritans at this time, it's important to know some of the cultural details for this story to make any sense. And um, as many of you know, Samaritans at this time were the bad guys, right? If, If we were making a movie of this, we would cast like Christopher Walken or 
or Willem Dafoe to play the Samaritan. Some creepy bad guy would be playing the Samaritan. So he comes along. Not only is he kind of the bad guy, the, 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 the typical um, cultural bad guy, but there's also religious reasons why um, Samaritans were despised. They believed a kind of heretical version of Judaism. They were not only culturally bad guys, they were spiritually bad guys. Um, if we were going to make this story, telling it in maybe making a movie in our modern terms, we would not make this a good Samaritan. We would probably make it a good jihadist, right? That's the kind of punch that Jesus is making in this story. The Presbyterian pastor walks by, you know, the head of the homeless shelter walks by, and then the Samaritan. The shock of the story is that it's a Samaritan who comes, sees, and does not pass by, something very different happens. The Samaritan sees, and our Bible said, took pity. And the word that is used here in our text is a really interesting word. It's uh, the Greek word splokna, which is just fun to say. I want to take whatever opportunity I can to say that word. But this is a particular kind of compassion. It's kind of like the compassion that it comes from your gut. That's what Jesus is referring to. Not the kind of natural response that maybe our phrases when we say, I heard the news and it made my stomach turn, or it made my heart sink. That's what happens. This natural response of compassion. Samaritan has this, but what would be even more shocking to the original hearers is to know that in the Bible, this word is almost never used of human beings. There's other words for mercy and compassion that are much more commonly used. This word is almost only used for God. God has compassion, this kind of compassion on his people. Jesus shows this kind of compassion. And so Jesus is telling a story where a Samaritan comes by, and then he attributes a kind of compassion that is only known to be expressed by God, a divine compassion. This is the shock of the story. The Samaritan sees, and then he's the one, not the religious leaders, that has this divine compassion. And then as the story goes on, this compassion is the turning point, right? He sees him, he has compassion, and he goes to him, and he bandages his wounds, and he puts him up on his donkey, and he takes him into town, and he pays his fare, and then he writes a blank check to the innkeeper and says, when I get back, whatever you have to Whatever expenses you've had, I'll, I'll cover them. So this compassion leads to a kind of commitment, kind of tangible um, involvement. Uh, it leads to at least inconvenience, right? He was going somewhere else, and his plans entirely changed because of the compassion that he experienced when he saw this man left for dead. But it's more than just uh, inconvenience, actually, it's probably, it's probably taking on some personal risk. There's a Bible scholar who lived in the Middle East for many years named Ken Bailey, and he said, this is a little bit like in an old Western, if an, if an Indian comes upon a cowboy with two arrows in his back, and he puts the cowboy up on his horse, and he rides into Dodge City, right? He's risking everybody misunderstanding what's going on. He's putting himself at risk to help this man. So the difference that this compassion makes, this divine compassion, couldn't be clearer between the priest and the Levite and then this Samaritan. So Jesus then asks the expert in the law, of these three men, which do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell among thieves? Remember the original question, right? The original question was, who is my neighbor or who is not my neighbor? But Jesus has turned this upside down and inside out. No longer is the question, um, who is not my neighbor, but to whom am I called to be a neighbor, right? Neighbor is no longer some category out there which people either fit into or not and qualify for or not, and we then love as ourselves the people who qualify as neighbor. Neighbor now becomes something that we become. 
neighbor becomes a possibility for us. It's no longer something that we can identify and check off our list and feel good about ourselves, justify ourselves by thinking, well, we've done that. We've loved our neighbor as ourselves. It's not this safe love anymore that just consists of doing the things we already don't mind doing for the people we don't mind doing them for. It's changed, completely changed. And then (laughs) Jesus takes this incredibly challenging story with all of the um, shock and and, um, challenge of it, and he says so casually, go and do that. Just that, what I just described, you go and do that. This is what it looks like. This story is what it means to love your neighbor as yourself, and that's what I want you to do. This should not leave us nodding our heads, but gasping for air, right? Because I know as I read this story that I am so much more like the priest and the Levite. Not only do I sort of walk by people who are sleeping on benches, I don't even really like, I get a little nervous lending out books to people, right? I bear way more resemblance to the priest and the Levite than the Samaritan. In fact, I think if we're talking about resemblance, who's like who here? The person who's most like the good Samaritan is actually Jesus himself. And we might be the priest and the Levite, but we might also be the man left for dead by the side of the road. Because Jesus himself, I think that when we recognize that it's Jesus who's the good Samaritan, it's Jesus who's the great Samaritan, that's the key to us being able to go and do likewise in our own lives. Because he's the one, the unlikely passerby that no one expected, who comes, walks down the road, and sees the people in need, and does what no one else will do and no one else could do, where he stops and experiences a kind of compassion that only God can experience. And and that compassion causes him to stop and make the problems of the beaten up and the broken down his own. He's the one who not only bandages our wounds, but is actually wounded for us, takes a beating for us. He doesn't only put us up on his donkey to take us to shelter. He actually takes our sin on his shoulders all the way to the cross. He doesn't just put himself at inconvenience or at risk, but he puts himself up on a cross and in a tomb for us so that we might live again. He's the one who pays the price, writes that blank check, and says, I'm going to cover all of the expenses. It's Jesus who's the great Samaritan. And um, as uh, prophet Isaiah said this so well, He says, he took up our pain and he bore our suffering. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds, we are healed. And so I think that until we are captured by this truth, not that we ought to be, not first, that we ought to be the Good Samaritan, but that Jesus is the great Samaritan, we will probably never just go and do likewise. We will much more likely just be very well-behaved, busy experts in the law who uh, know all the right answers, but ironically let those answers get in the way of obeying what God calls us to do passing by the needy and the broken that are all around us. I think if we don't realize that it's Jesus who has done this for us, then we're never going to ultimately be able to avoid that tendency of our horizon shrinking until the Jesus creed is just kind of what we already feel like we've got space and time to do for the people we like. But when we realize that Jesus has done this for us, and all of a sudden, something else happens. Paul talks about in Romans the renewal of our minds that can transform us. He talks about in chapter 5 of Romans that God's love is poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given to us. 
God's love, divine compassion, is given to us by God. It's put in us by God. When we receive Christ, we receive His Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, who has this kind of divine compassion. And then we are enabled by that Spirit to go and do likewise. So again, we're seeing how love for God and love for others are interwoven. You can't pull these things apart because it's um, any version of spirituality which, which separates these, which makes love for God, um, which when love for God keeps us from loving our neighbor, that's something different than what Jesus was teaching. Because our love for neighbor flows out of our love for God, and our love for God flows out of this recognition of how we have been loved by God, that we are the neighbor that Jesus loved as he loved himself. And when that happens, um, we realize that it flows the other way too, that God has given us our neighbor to love as an expression of love for him. This only happens, I think, when we realize what, what Jesus has done for us and that he is the one who empowers us to go and do likewise. And I love how, how he tells this story because he makes love for neighbor something that is impossible to avoid, right? It's uh, the possibilities for, for loving our neighbor are all around us. He tells a story of a guy who is just going somewhere else. This Samaritan, not a religious professional. He's probably just going on a business trip or something. And he's certainly not um, out on a mission program, mission, short-term mission trip or anything. He's just living his life, and he's going somewhere else, and he sees need. And so our neighbor, the go and do likewise, is something that is all around us. It's, it's, it can begin uh, as we're just living our lives. We may be heading somewhere else, but the possibility to love our neighbor shows up all the time. I recently um, came across a quote that I love, and it says this, everybody wants to change the world, nobody wants to do the dishes. Everybody wants to change the world, nobody wants to do the dishes. And I think that the Jesus Creed, this, this invitation to love our neighbor as ourselves, is an invitation to recognize that how God changes the world is through a lot of people who being willing to do the dishes. We do the small things of responding to the needs that God puts in front of us, and that's how the world gets changed. And so loving your neighbor begins with your neighbors, your families, our friends, our coworkers, the people who are already in our spheres, who are already on the road, that we're already walking. But because Jesus tells a story about a Samaritan, we're reminded that we're also called to go and do likewise uh, in a way that crosses a boundary, in a way that maybe stretches us. And so it's both the people right around us and it's the people that are just across a boundary for us. And so I think about, um, we heard about uh, Acts for Youth, and I think about how many people in this church have, um, have done that, have kind of crossed a boundary of age or neighborhood, race, to make the problems of young men in our city their own, in a way. I think that's a great example of what we've got. Or I think about Hope Springs, where so many of us in this sanctuary have been willing to reach out and love and bandage the wounds of somebody who maybe other people are afraid to touch. All of that are tangible, um, tangible examples of how this divine compassion enables us to go and do likewise. Because it's a good Samaritan. It's not just the people who happen to be around us. It's also the people who happen to be around us that require us to reach out across a boundary. Maybe even to people who seem to be our enemies. We had a great example of this last week. Some of us came here to, um, on Monday night to hear from a representative of SAT7, which is one of our mission partners. And um, SAT7 is a Christian television programming network that um, communicates the Christian message in places like North Africa and the Middle East where uh, the Christian message is not typically broadcast far and wide. 
And we heard from uh, one of the hosts of the show came to speak with us, and he told us an incredible story. He had recently been in a uh, refugee camp of people who had been fleeing from ISIS, as ISIS is kind of heading across that region, leaving destruction in its wake. And we heard, I know you've heard about ISIS, but you probably haven't heard about this little girl named Miriam, and her voice is one that I want to invite you to hear. We've got a little bit of uh, Assam's conversation with Miriam. I'll invite you to watch. واحنا موجودين هنا في المخيم لقينا بنوته فوجئتني هي بتقول ان هي بتتفرج على ليش هيك واسمها مريم ازيك يا مريم زينه انت كيفك انا زي الفل انت بتتفرج على ليش هيك فعلا ايوه حبي سات 7 كيدز ايه انت فين بلدك جاي من قراقوش برضو ايوه من قراقوش انا طيب انت عندك 10 سنين مش كده ايوه طيب قولي لي انت بقالك قد ايه هنا في المخيم اربع اشهر ايه اكتر حاجه انت حاسه ان هي كنت بتحبيها في قراكوش مش موجوده هنا دلوقتي في المخيم كان عندنا بيت وكنا متونسين بس يعني هنا ما متونسين بس الحمد لله يعني الله سترنا قصدك ايه يعني ايه الله سترنا يعني الله حب حبنا و... وما قبل يعني يقتلونا داعش طيب انت حاسه قد ايه ربنا بيحبك صح ايوه ربنا بيحبنا كلنا مو مو بس انا كل الناس يحبوهم الله وانت شايفه ان ربنا كمان بيحب الناس اللي ممكن تبقى اذتك وزعلتك ولا لا يحبوهم بس ما يحب الشيطان طب انت شايفه انت حاسه بايه ناحيه الناس اللي ممكن تبقى خرجتك من البيت وتعبتك ما راح اسويهم ولا شيء بس يعني اقول لله يسامحهم وانت تقدري تسامحيهم كمان؟ ايوه بس دي حاجة صعبة قوي ولا حاجة سهلة ان انا اعرف اسامح الناس اللي تعبتني يا مريم ما راح اقتلهم يعني ليه اقتلهم بس بس زعلانة ليه طلعوني من بيتنا طلعونا من بيتنا I love the question he asks. You know how much God loves you, don't you? And she says, yes, and God loves us all. She knows how much God loves her. She knows what uh, Jesus has done for her. And that enables something that is mind-blowing. That enables her to see those people who are pursuing her to kill her as neighbors that God has called her to love. This is what we're talking about. This divine compassion that when we know how much God loves us, all kinds of new things become possible. We see compassion, in the, feel compassion in the most unexpected ways. We see our neighbor in the most unexpected places. Jesus changes us with his divine compassion so that our enemies become our neighbors, our neighbors become all around us, and um, they are people that God has called us to be a neighbor to and to love as he has loved us, to love as we love ourselves. And he can, do this, he can do this for us. He has done it for us, and he can enable us to go and do likewise, to love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you and praise you for being the one who comes and finds us beaten up on the road of life, and you lift us up and you give us life again. We pray that you would help us by your spirit to go and do likewise. We want to pray that you would give us a heart that sees the needs of our neighbor and makes them our own. Pray that you would help us to um, to go and do likewise. We recognize that we need changed hearts, we need changed minds, so that when we see needs, we think differently about them. So would you renew our minds so that we really can love you with all of our minds and then love our neighbor as ourselves? Lord, we also want to lift up this little girl and all those who are suffering as she is, displaced and in need, and we pray that 
We thank you for their witness and pray that we would be strengthened to live lives of faithfulness that give you glory, that cross that boundary and love as we have been loved in Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen.